Hi everyone, Liz Mackingbell here. So excited to continue our virtual live stream questions today with just me. So as you know, I do the Ask the Experts with Chris Tronson on Wednesdays. And then also we do a um, live lunch and learn where we bring in guests and talk about different things. But you guys have so many questions and you guys post them and share them. And sometimes we get to them, sometimes we don't. But as I promised before, I wanna make sure that we get caught up. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time today answering questions that have been pre-submitted or questions that we haven't had a chance to get to. So I'm just gonna kind of hop in and I'm gonna do my best to answer them all and we will go from there. As always, if you have continued questions, please go to iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind, put your questions there so that we can make sure we answer them. Additionally, this is not intended to replace therapy. This is intended to be educational and I will do my best to provide some education and support but for individual treatment related questions, we want you working with your own provider. And of course, if you're feeling unsafe or suicidal, please call 911, go to your local emergency room or call your suicide prevention hotline. Let's hop in. All right, first question that was submitted is how do I deal with intrusive thoughts that I find really gross and that go against my morality? This is a great question and so important because what I want to reemphasize and make sure we talk a little bit about is that most of our intrusive thoughts, most of the things for OCD that get stuck, right? The things that become sticky, go against our values, go against things that are really important to us. And that's part of the reason why they get stuck, right? Because if something that didn't mean a lot to us or that wasn't important to us um, was a thought, it might not become a trigger. It might not get stuck because it doesn't have as much importance, weight, or value. And so what are we teaching you to do? We are teaching you to lean in, to accept the thoughts, because the reality is, is we don't have a choice anyways. These thoughts are thoughts and we want to be able to see them as thoughts. But when we respond with anxiety, with urgency, we make the thoughts much bigger than what they are, which is they're just thoughts, right? And we want to see them as thoughts. When we respond with urgency, anxiety, and rituals, we not only confirm that, that, that they're more than thoughts, we're treating them as if they're reality, right? That we need to do something to feel better. And every time we respond to them, we make them bigger, we make them more powerful. And so we want to treat them as a thought, versus as a trigger. And so how do you treat with intrusive thoughts that you find gross? We want to engage with them through ERP. We, we don't want to engage with them by trying to solve them or by engaging with them with compulsions, because what that will do is will make them bigger. But we want to engage with them in the sense that we want to approach them, not act as if we're scared of them and we can't face them. And that will allow us to be able to move on. And so if I have a thought that uh, this doorknob might have a bloodborne illness on it, which is terrifying and scary to me, the more I avoid touching the doorknob, the more I confirm that the doorknob is dangerous or could be dangerous. If I touch the doorknob, but I wash my hands, I do a ritual, I once again am confirming that the doorknob is dangerous, that the doorknob is scary. And so how do I approach it? How do I address it? How do I deal with that scary thought of the doorknob? I approach the doorknob, I touch the doorknob, I engage in response prevention, I don't do the ritual. And what will happen is I will start to see that the doorknob isn't that scary. The doorknob will start to not bring me a lot of anxiety and distress. But the second piece that's equally as important as the exposure and not engaging in the ritual is that we also lean into the fear, right? So we want to approach the fear that like, okay, we don't know for sure that touching this doorknob is going to be totally safe. Like we don't know for sure that nothing is going to happen, right? Instead, we want to accept the uncertainty everyone else accepts by touching doorknobs. So we want to approach the fear. So kind of like, okay, like, all right, that's what my brain's telling me. That's a thought. And I'm going to treat it as a thought by still approaching it. If we treat it as a trigger by, oh my gosh, I need to solve it. I need to understand it. I need to know for sure I'm safe. We will get more stuck. The next question is, when I try to apply recovery methods, I start obsessing over recovery. Like when I leave my room, I'm pulled down by anxious thoughts. Any advice? This is a great question. And one that's important to, to acknowledge and to note, one thing that's really critical is to remember that OCD morphs. It jumps from one thing to another. And so what we might find actually is that we start obsessing about recovery at, or ERP or treatment, right? Am I doing treatment well? Am I doing treatment the right way? What if I'm doing this incorrectly? What if I never get better? What if recovery um, doesn't last for me? What if I experience depression down the road? How do we treat it? We treat it the same way, right? Again, we approach our fear. So we don't want to suppress our fear because if we suppress it, it'll keep coming up. So we don't want to do things like, oh, well, 
I, I don't, I don't want to think about that. I can't think about recovery. And so I just need to move on with my day because again, we're moving on with our day, but by suppressing the thought of thinking about recovery, it will keep being a big part of our day, right? We will continue to have these thoughts about recovery throughout our day. The way we actually address it is like, okay, like, I don't know for sure what recovery might look like, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean into the fact that like, I'm doing well right now and I'm going to keep moving on with my day, right? I'm going to live my life. So it's about living by our values, acknowledging our fear, approaching our fear, letting it be there and moving on, not suppressing it, right? We can't suppress. So it's important to know what is that core fear? Is the core fear about recovery? Is it about what it'll mean for the rest of your life? Is it about career? Is it about relationships? Like what is it so that you can approach it fully and lean in? What are some ways that ERP can be used for animal phobias? So this is a great question. And really, if you think about it, it can be used for, so, ERP can be used for so many different um, different things, whether it's phobias, social anxiety, fear of flying, and it's really a lot more exposure-based because when you think about an animal phobia, there's probably a lot of avoidance, right? We avoid animals, we're not engaging with animals, but there might not be a ton of rituals. So we may not need to do as much response prevention, but we certainly need to do exposure. So we might start with a lower level exposure, like thinking about an animal and maybe even looking at like a stuffed animal or a cartoon and eventually work up to looking at images of animals, eventually videos of animals, and then looking at real animals from a distance and eventually touching animals, right? But we're slowly going to approach the things that we're afraid of and do it in a meaningful way. So I want the top of your hierarchy not to just be spending time touching an animal, but an animal that you're excited to touch. What would be an animal that if you did that, that would be a part of your values and important to you so that we can actually be excited and proud and hopeful when we get to those higher level exposures. Um, Does accepting OCD treatment automatically mean we have to accept hospitalization or medication, or do we get to decide that? Uh, This is a great question and really important. So Absolutely accepting treatment does not mean we have to accept inpatient or hospitalization or certain types of medications. What accepting treatment means is that we are accepting that we want to get better, that we want to address our symptoms, and that we're fighting for freedom. And the only thing I ask when we think about accepting treatment is that you have an open mind. You have an open mind to whatever your needs are. And the reality is, is that no one's going to know the needs until you start working with a provider. But when you start working with an OCD specialist, we should be able to guide you um, around what we think would be the most helpful for you, right? Whether that is outpatient care, higher level of care, and um, if you should consider medication, some people might try behavioral therapy first and then start with med- and then jump into medication if needed. Some people um, might want to navigate it without medication first and see if that works. Some people start with medication. There's not necessarily a right or wrong. It's what works for you, what's important to you. And the only thing I ask is be open-minded because the reality is, is the best treatment is what we're, the treatment that works for you, not necessarily a standard treatment I can tell you, right? We want somebody to use ERP, to use evidence-based interventions, but we also want it to be what is moving the needle for you, what is showing and having the best outcomes. Um, is it common for young adults with OCD to repeat the same words of songs over and over again? Yes, we could see that happen, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's OCD. So, right, again, I don't know as much detail about this, but it's important to know that not all rituals are OCD, but OCD certainly has rituals. So that could be an OCD behavior depending on the reasoning, the function. So why are they repeating the words um, and what purpose does it serve? But it could not be an OCD behavior. Um, how can ERP work for people with phobias developed in childhood? For example, when the person is able to avoid the phobia and get by, but the, but struggles because of lack of access to the feared things such as animals. So again, this is where it's really important for us to think about what are our values and what's important to us. And for many of us, we can justify why we don't need to approach certain fears, right? We could say things like, well, I don't know that I, I have to do that exposure or, you know, hey, why do I need to go to an HIV clinic if I don't work in healthcare and I'm not going to necessarily really like that's not something that I really need to be facing as like a healthcare clinic um, with patients and that sort of thing. But the reality is, is that there are times when that will butt up against, you know, your values um, of something's important to you, but you're choosing not to do it because of the risk that you'll be triggered by that fear. And then the reality is, is that for those of us with OCD, right, what we also know is that you don't have to go to an HIV clinic to encounter 
HIV in different ways, right? In the sense that you may not encounter HIV on a dangerous level, but OCD would think it's dangerous, but there people can be anywhere. You don't have to go to a clinic to interact with someone with HIV or, you know, to touch something that someone else has touched. But again, that's not dangerous or risky. OCD tells you it might be dangerous or risky. And so it's how can we make sure that we're engaging in exposures that are values-based and can we see how we can actually do some of these exposures across the board in everyday situations in life. It's really about leaning into the unknown and acknowledging that the unknown is there. With OCD, it often wants us to never acknowledge it, right? So we kind of want to say like, okay, like if I have a fear of COVID, right, I'm not necessarily going to lean into the fact that COVID could be here and be in this grocery store. But the reality is, is that it could. And by trying to say like, oh, going to the grocery store is safe, there's no danger here. We can't confirm that for sure. We actually want to accept the fact that like, yeah, like we don't know for sure, but what we know is that it's an important value to be able to go to the grocery store and to not be stuck spending the whole time worrying about whether or not we're going to catch an illness or something's going to happen. How do you get comfortable with embracing uncertainty when that means the things you are most afraid of could come true? This is a really, really good question. And it's one that I'm actually going to push back at you. What I mean by that, you're like, what does that mean, Liz? How do you get comfortable with embracing uncertainty when that means the things you're most afraid of could come true? Do you have another choice? Can, if you don't embrace uncertainty, does that mean you're stopping these things from ever coming true? No, right? So the reality is, is that when we talk about approaching fear, when we talk about uncertainty, we're not asking you to accept certainty around the negative thing, right? So if I have a fear of, if I have pedophilia OCD, I don't need to accept that I'm a pedophile because I'm not, that goes against my values, who I am. I would never want to accept that. But what I do have to accept is that I can't be 100% certain um, that I am never going to have a bad thought or that I'm never going to have a sexual intrusive thought or right. Like OCD wants us to be hundred percent certain that those thoughts have no meaning that those thoughts have zero relevance, you know, and OCD wants certainty, which isn't necessarily possible or not necessarily, it isn't possible. Right. So think about if I have the fear when I'm, um, you know, sitting at work, I have a thought of what if something bad happens to my mom? I can't be 100% certain that nothing bad is going to happen to my mom. That doesn't mean for treatment, I need to be okay with bad things happening to my mom, right? Because I don't, it doesn't mean I want that. I don't want bad things to happen. I don't want to accept that like, okay, for certain something terrible is going to happen to my mom. That's not what I want. But I do have to accept the unknown, which is that I don't know for sure that nothing bad is ever going to happen to my mom. And how do I be okay with it? Well, we have to learn to be okay with it because we don't actually have a choice. There is not a way where we can live life knowing for sure that nothing bad is ever going to happen to my mom, right? I can't, that's not possible. And so what we're asking you to do is to accept the uncertainty everyone else accepts in their life. The difference though, is that for those of us with OCD, it's in our face. It's it's, we like have to acknowledge the acceptance of the uncertainty for people without OCD. They're already accepting the uncertainty, but they don't have to outwardly accept it because the thought isn't a trigger, right? It's just the thought. So when someone with those without OCD gets a weird thought, it never becomes anything else because they don't, they don't respond to it. They're right. It doesn't become sticky. It doesn't latch on. And so they don't really have to outwardly accept uncertainty but they're already accepting uncertainty by not responding to it, right? They're not responding in and of itself is like just seeing it as a thought and moving on. We want to teach people with OCD to do the same thing. And the way we teach you is by kind of you, we, those of us with OCD, myself included, right? We have to outwardly accept uncertainty in, louder, right? And bigger and in a more relevant way than people without OCD, because we don't have a choice. If we choose to just kind of all right, I'm going to pretend like I'm not going to do anything about it at all. And we're suppressing it. It will keep coming up. Right. And so the way we allow it to go away is by acknowledging that like, eh, like there's that thought and I'm not going to do anything about it. And so again, uncertainty doesn't always mean it has to be these like worst case scenarios or this like detailed script or this huge amount of BRP, right? Sometimes it can be really quick. So when I had a sexual intrusive thought about my daughter a couple months ago, 
I had the thought in the morning and I had to run group at the clinic. And so I woke up, I had the thought for me, accepting uncertainty was choosing to not solve the thought, right? Because we can acknowledge that choosing to try to figure out why to have that thought. What does that thought mean? What relevance is that thought? Why is it there? Any of that sort of behavior was a compulsion or would have been a compulsion or a ritual and would have gotten me more stuck, right? Solving gets you stuck. Compulsions make you more confused. And the whole day I would have been more triggered. If I would have suppressed the thought of like, I can't think that thought, why am I thinking it? I need to distract myself by showering and getting ready and going to work and just trying to like make sure I don't have that thought. It would have kept coming up and creeping up and would have continued to be a trigger throughout my day. So the way I approached it and the way I addressed uncertainty was like, okay, I'm having this thought. I can choose to solve it and get more stuck. I can choose to suppress it, but instead I'm just going to acknowledge that like, oh, like there's that thought and I don't like it. It's gross. And who knows why I'm having that thought or who knows what it means. And I'm going to move on. And I chose to still shower and come to group and come to work. And by the time I was running group and by the time my day had started, I didn't even remember I had the thought. And it was because I allowed the thought to be there. I didn't try to hurry up and get rid of it. But then at the same time, I also lived by my values while acknowledging the uncertainty that existed. What are some examples of exposures for real event OCD? Um, this is a great question. So real event OCD is when there was a true event or trigger that then onset OCD symptoms. And so oftentimes exposures are going to be things like just allowing us to kind of maybe think about that event or think about that situation and not try to solve it, not try to figure it out. Um, but really, it's hard to say what the exposure for yours would be because it's it's much more about can we acknowledge what the event was and then can we do OCD treatment for it? So an example might be, I'm playing basketball with my nephew and I have an intrusive thought and I throw the basketball to him and he says, ow. And, you know, I have an intrusive thought that like maybe I hurt him or caused harm to him. There was a real event that might've happened there, right? I'm playing basketball with him. I throw the basketball to him. I might, the ball might've hit him or hurt him. Right. But he says, ow, he really does get hurt. And so, my OCD might get stuck on wanting to like, I want to replay the event. I want to know exactly what happened. I want to make sure I didn't harm him. I want to, I might engage in behaviors like confessing to my sister about it, um, telling, apologizing to my nephew, whatever it might be, where the exposure might actually be like acknowledging that, okay, like, I don't know for sure if my nephew is okay or not in the sense that like, yes, he's okay, right? If, if he was okay, I don't have to like go into these scripts and pretend that he's not okay or something like that. But I don't know, I can't confirm with 100% certainty that my action didn't hurt him at all. Right. And so instead I want to acknowledge that like, okay, I threw the basketball to him who knows um, like what degree it hurt him, but like, I'm going to accept the uncertainty that I don't think he's, I don't think he's injured. Right. And we're going to move on. And I still choose to move on and not try to solve and figure out and know for sure. Right. So it's again, what is the function of the behavior? If the function of the behavior is to make sure we didn't do something wrong, to know for sure, to have full certainty, we're going to get more stuck. And so the exposures in general with OCD, it's about accepting the unknown that you already have to accept anyways, right? No matter how many rituals you do, you cannot know for sure. And so instead, we want to stop the rituals and just not know for sure, be okay with not knowing for sure and move on because that's what people without OCD do on their own anyways. Um, can real event OCD be, um, can, can it be concurrent with any subtype? So contamination, scrupulosity, relationship or harm, yes. So I would say that real event OCD can be around any subtype, right? It could be um, a real event related to contamination. Think about COVID. There's so much real event OCD around COVID that's happening that, that could be a trigger. It could certainly be with relationships, right? Something actually happens in a relationship and then OCD attaches onto it and starts to distort it, starts to create false memories, starts to um, make us wanna know something for sure that we might not be able to know for sure, et cetera. Last question I'm going to get to today is in ruminating type of OCD, can we intentionally trigger the thought and tolerate the anxiety during the period when we're feeling good? Or should we do ERP when thoughts come naturally? Um, 100% you can trigger the thought, right? So this is actually what treatment is in general, whether you're doing treatment on an outpatient or more intensive setting, we are going to create opportunities for you to face your fears, for you to um, be able to live your life, right? That's really the goal. And so 
sometimes there are what we would call um, an unplanned trigger, right? So you're in the world and it's a real life trigger, right? And that's great. You can do ERP in that moment on the go, as I would call it. But there's also times where we need to kind of intentionally create or, or intentionally face anxiety provoking situations. And we can do that in treatment, right? So we intentionally um, might have you eat food that you don't, you know, read the expiration date or, you know, ask the, ask about the expiration date and things like that, because you have a fear of food poisoning, but you choose to just order, order something off the menu and eat it. Right. And we can go to a restaurant and intentionally kind of do that exposure, right? Your, your goal is I want to be able to eat at restaurants with friends and not get stuck asking questions and ruminating or avoiding eating altogether. And so we intentionally will go to a restaurant or have you go to a restaurant um, to, to kind of not to say simulate, but it kind of will be right. But to evoke and face or approach that fear. And that's what the exposures around that can look like is we absolutely in treatment are going to be intentionally encouraging you to do exposures or intentionally encouraging you to engage in activities you previously or currently avoid in order to be able to get freedom, right? That is the point of treatment is, can we allow you to have freedom versus functioning? I don't want it to be that you white knuckle. I don't want it to be that doing things that are important to you or values based for you are terrifying and scary. We want to be able to engage in, have you understanding why the treatment makes sense and have you actually want to do the treatment because you want to get freedom and you know that it's possible with appropriate care. Remember with appropriate treatment, freedom is possible from OCD and that's what we're fighting for. That's it for today. As um, myself, Liz, answers some of your questions, we will continue to do this and continue to post them as we chip away at the many questions y'all submit. Please visit iocdf.org for more information and iocdf.org slash peace of mind to learn more about all of our virtual programming and our content. And I'm so excited to see y'all soon.